My, uh, my job is to be controversial, and uh, I'm, uh, also, I like to also engage in topics which, uh, in a society currently, is being viewed as uh, difficult to explain, there's a loads of misconceptions. Uh, a lot of people uh, focus on uh, cherry picking negative aspects of this, and in some ways, I'm going to be trying to bust misconceptions, but at the same time, I'm also going to try to explain um, warts and all, so to speak, to what the system is and how I believe uh, that it can provide a solution uh, for mankind. Now, my, uh, my history of, I guess, the question when Robert mentioned that I used to be an Anglican Christian, it's like, uh, oh, I'm a Christian, so why did you leave that become Muslim? And like, you know, why did you, you know, give up uh, you know, a lot of the, the kind of, uh, should we say, enjoyments that uh, is more uh, Christianity or the Protestant version of Christianity is more lax in conservative, more conservative law system like Sharia. And the very interesting thing about it was when I was growing up in my, um, in my community and so on, was I, I didn't know much about Islam, but I, I had something in the back of my mind um, growing up, was that uh, human beings weren't really meant to live like this. In this kind of very competitive society, in a society where you're judged on your superficial looks and where you know, no one really um, gives you any worth unless you are of some utility in some way, shape, or form. If you have some particular attribute about you, like, like Mozart, great celebrated guy, wonderful genius, and so on. Why? Because he could produce something. Not that he had an intrinsic value uh, that was something interesting. And unfortunately, in a very superficial society that we are you know, living in today, I was thinking, is this how human beings are valued? You know, why is it that uh, you know there's you, you make jokes, uh, jokes about the, the person gets picked last in school and for, for, for the sports and so on, and people you know, make jokes and fun about each other. I was thinking to myself that in this kind of you know, in this situation, there's there's poverty, even though there's there's more than enough resources in the world to feed everybody. People think overpopulation is the problem in the world, but I'll, I'll deal with what the real issue is in a second. But I just thought to myself, there has to be a better way of life for uh, mankind. And there must be, I, I, I felt that we weren't meant to live like this. It's not actually the natural state for a human being. And if you consider the kind of situations that we live in in this day and age, within the last two, three hundred years, um, a lot of the work we live in, the environments we live in, is very artificial, very artificial environments. We're subject to over uh, stimulus from you know, advertising, telling us not just how um, this product can solve a problem, but also what you want. So that these advertisements are not just saying, oh, make your choice up, make your mind up, you know, free will choice, that's all great. No, it's even telling you, here's what you should want. And we, we can provide it, even though you never wanted it before. So there's a whole myriad of issues. Um, and uh, I can enumerate the many, many uh, social ills that I saw growing up in, in this society. And this led me to actually researching into different ways of life and so on. And I never thought that Islam had anything because it, it, it just seemed a bit too basic and the people who were claiming to be Muslims in the Muslim world seemed much more technologically backward compared to the West. I thought, there's probably nothing in it. I'll look elsewhere, maybe Buddhism, maybe communism, what have you, I'll, I'll have a look around. And I, I just stumbled, I literally just stumbled on an aspect of Islam where I heard that women were asked you know, to wear the hijab in Islam. And I just asked myself the question, why? You know, why is Islam, you know, why do you want women to wear the job, uh, the, uh, the head covering, the veil? What was the purpose of it? You know, what is Islam trying to achieve by this? And I was thinking about it, and you know, at that time there was a silly little uh, American TV series called Alec and Bill on, on Channel 4 at that time. And you had this kind of uh, neurotic, uh, obviously, woman, uh, uh, and all the kind of uh, sexual tensions she encounters in her office and so and, and the fact that she's judged by her looks and she's concerned over the degradation of her looks over time and her body talks clicking uh, ticking and she has to manage her career and also have to uh, get uh, manage her natural relationship have a child and so all this kind of stuff and i just want to myself well, well it seems to me that what islam is trying to do is it, it, it wants to eliminate at least sexual tension from society by um, kind of desexualizing women and allowing them to go out of society, and we can, you know, men and women can participate and work together without this sexual tension being there. We can focus on the job at hand without all these, these other, you know, subsidiary issues. And I thought that sounds very interesting, actually. I've never known a religion to be so prescriptive in that sense uh, that I've encountered anyway. And so that I started to research more. 
And my modus operandi is I like to poke holes in things. I like to find weak spots or things that contradict. And, I, and the more I try to find it in the psalm, and trust me, I was very um, cynical, uh, the more that it rebuffed me. And I saw some interesting uh, solutions, which I never imagined before. And even though I have not lived under such uh, a system myself, but it seemed to naturally fit uh, human nature. And even, well, obviously, becoming a Muslim and implementing it, at least within my, my, my house, within the, to, to the extent I can do, I saw the benefits it yielded to be, being a Muslim and following the Sharia that regulates. It doesn't, it's, not, it's not designed to suppress human nature. It's designed to regulate it so that you can be fulfilled, not the other way around. And I'll, and I'll, go, I'll get onto this uh, through a kind of methodical um, study of, of what uh, Sharia is and how it deals with these solutions. Now, I think, you know, I suppose a lot of people who have been to lectures on Sharia would know that the word Sharia means uh, path, or, and in some ways, in terms of this entomological background, it means obviously a path to water. It was very much an Arabic term amongst, you know, the, the desert-dwelling uh, population of Arabia, whereby a path to water was a, a place, you know, for salvation, you're thirsty, you're in a desert, it's hot, you could die, die, you could dehydrate, and there are known paths which will lead to oases, and this would save you. And so the term Sharia uh, came to uh, be taken from this uh, kind of root entomology. And now it, it, it means, uh, it could be used as well as law, but in some ways it's a path to salvation according to other uh, definitions. But essentially, what does Sharia do? What is it about? Why are Muslims so fixated on it? Why does Islam and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi talk about it? What is it essentially, and how does it actually solve the problems? I could talk about all day saying it's from law and it's for great, you should follow it, but how does it solve the problems? Let, let's get to the nitty gritty. You know, you know, Martin Luther King said, uh, truthfully, it's not the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. Uh, Henri Frédéric Agnel, a Swiss philosopher, said, uh, liberty, equality, bad principles. The only true principle for humanity is justice, and justice to the feeble is protection and kindness. So, the concept that in Islam, we see that uh, there's one thing that we don't, we, we don't overemphasize freedom and liberty, and the, we emphasize this other word called justice. And in a way, this is the, the, the kind of the word that we use as an all, all overarching uh, basis that underpins our, our system of Sharia. Justice, uh, I think, is very prominent throughout the Quran. There are so many, there are so many verses in the Quran and the narration of Prophet Muhammad which talk about justice. And it comes in terms like this, like, um, I've done justice to you, I've fulfilled my contract, for example. Or uh, a woman who complains to Prophet Muhammad so, so, so I'm saying that my husband is doing injustice to me, he's not giving me my due rights as a human being, for example. Or you had, um, you know, uh, being, uh, being just, being fair, impartial, judging by what is equitable, and of course, to uh, the more interesting definition, to realize one's own uh, uh, purpose, one's own nature. And in Islam, we have a concept called fitrah, which means human nature, essentially. And we, and uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that all uh, human beings are born upon the fitrah. They're born with a essential human nature. And this human nature is common to all, all human beings. So the purpose of Islam is to now do justice to this human nature and allow it to realize itself without um, impinging on anybody else's um, human nature. <coughs> now, let, let's start with the word justice. Everyone thinks, yeah, I know what the word justice means. Justice is just like, yeah, being fair, equitable, that's, that's very simple, right? Why do I need some divinely given law? Well, the uh, philosopher, American literary theorist and legal scholar, Stanley Fish said, um, to illustrate Confusions around justice. He said, I think it is fair to distribute goods and privileges equally, irrespective of the accomplishments of those who receive them. You think it is fair to reward each according to his efforts. I think it is fair when everyone has a chance to speak. You may think it is fair when everyone who is qualified has a chance to speak. The disagreements between us cannot be settled by the invocation of fairness because what divides us and our different views is what fairness actually is. So everyone can say, yeah, we don't believe justice, right? But it means different things to different people. So now we have to discuss now what is justice, what is fairness. 
And this hopefully should lead us to understand how the Sharia provides solutions. In the Quran, it says in uh, Surah Al Hadid, uh, verse 25, it says, We sent our messengers with clear signs and send that send with them the book and the criterion of balance so that they may conduct themselves with justice. Now it says that all justice, all law that you follow is based on something that's intangible. You can't uh, put a microscope to it, you can't analyze it in a, a laboratory, and that is values. No um, empiricist, atheist, scientist can come along and say, I can deduce values from experimentation. All values are what we call metaphysical. They are not physical, they are about physical. They are values. As you, value, you, you, you go to a shop, you see a, a product, and it's valued, it has a certain value to it. And this, the product is real, it's physical, but the value is not physical, but it's about the physical. Metaphysics, about physics, from the Greek word. So, the, what human beings need is to be told what the values of things are. Because we don't know what the values of things are. You can put all kinds of different values. On, on things. Example, one person, you know, people said the golden rule is treat other people as you wish to be treated. Okay, fine. Just the other day, just the other day, there was a, a woman in the audience and she started to film all the members of the audience during a talk. She started to film all the members of the audience during a talk. And so we approached her and said, you know, could you not do this please because, you know, all people don't like it and they were complaining and they were quite worried. So why is this person only filming members of the audience? It's a bit, it's a bit worried. And she goes, I don't mind people filming me. You can find them on camera, I don't care. So, you know, they shouldn't care. So, but they do care. So, in, in, not in, that's just one small example, but not, not in every case is it right to treat everyone as you don't mind being treated yourself. Because not everyone agrees with how you want to be treated yourself. So, you can't, it's not something that's intuitive. You require uh, revelation to give you these values. Even, even uh, Western liberalism itself was based on prior Christian uh, values, which gave birth to it. John Locke was one of the famous uh, liberalist scholars. He was a practicing Christian. He wrote books on Christianity, uh, detailing his doctrines very, very specifically. So it's very interesting uh, that uh, you know values must come from revelation. You can't get anywhere else. If you if you if you're going to say I, I, I'm going to write some values down, it's just arbitrary. You're just writing it down because it's your tastes and so on. Now, what is the purpose of Shah? What does it actually do? The Quran explains in Surah 7, verse 157, it says, He will enjoin upon them uh, which, are, uh, which is right and forbid uh, them which is wrong. He will make lawful for them all good things and prohibit for them all bad things. And he will relieve them of their burden and the fetters of which they used to wear. Fetters come kind of like, like, like chains or something like that, that ties you down. So the purpose of the Shari is it wants to. Uh, enjoying or to establish the good things, that's what benefits man's nature or, and, and, and advance it, and to prohibit the bad things which is detriment to man's nature, and to take off the burden of mankind, the, the, the various problems that it, 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 can, it might accidentally cause itself, and people might uh, step into those toes, and to release them from the kind of suffering and the kind of uh, restrictions that uh, they face trying to fulfill themselves as human beings. Now, the Quran views everyone as being of equal value. Every human being has the same soul. It's a Judeo-Christian and Islamic concept of the Abrahamic faith. We all have the same soul. We are all fundamentally equal. However, we have different strengths and weaknesses. Some are more intelligent than others. Some are stronger than others. Some obviously can, uh, uh, can give birth to children. Obviously others can't. Obviously men can't give birth to children, despite what some of they expect the scientists might claim. Um, so, in this situation, that's fine, we'll be equal, but we all have different strengths and weaknesses. Now, naturally, any person here, Muslim, atheist, Christian, Jew, would conclude that, well, people who are good at something should you know, use this to better the society, the community. Is this now unfair, unfair you know, discrimination to do so? No, it's not. It's a meritocracy. If they have the ability to do something, they should do that and to help the, the, the wider people. Now this is how Islam views equality. It is not like a liberal system which views everything must be absolutely equal in every and if you're a communist, um, everyone must get the same income irrespective of your needs and requirements and so on and so forth. And it, so the and communist system suffered a problem with motivation of the masses. People weren't motivated if, no matter how hard you work, you get the same pay. 